So I want to talk about an important topic today. It's the human story behind the data. So we're going to have a good discussion about data ethics. All right, so before we actually hop into the discussion, I'm going to express a little bit about myself, okay, and about my journey into data science. So I got my bachelor's of science in biology from the illustrious HBCU called North Carolina Central University, which I am grateful for such a strong foundation from there. I then transcended as a high school engineering teacher for about three years. So I taught computer science and electrical engineering that was at the collegiate level or advanced placement classes for juniors and seniors. So those also have a small um, spot in my heart for my K through 12 educators. I then went to North Carolina State University, home of the first master's in data analytics program and got my master's of science in analytics. And then after getting my master's in analytics, I served as a consultant for pharmaceutical companies, a client services manager for higher education analytics. And now I'm back because education always has a soft place in my heart to be a data science educator here at Flatiron. Okay, so our agenda for today, we're going to go over four pillars of data ethics. After that, we're going to have some scenarios, and that's going to be your opportunity to engage with me pretty much of what would you do. So make sure that your chat is switched to everyone and not hosting panelists so that we can all engage and so I can see everyone's responses. After we go through these scenarios, one being within education, the other within healthcare, we're going to go over violations in policing, and then I'm going to wrap up with some conclusions. All right, so part one, data ethics. So how do I define data ethics, okay? So at the center of data ethics is data responsibility. You are responsible for the proper use of your data. You are responsible for looking at bias within your data, for analyzing how your machine learning model would be used. So I like to think of this as four pillars, bias, societal impact, privacy, and intent. And within those four pillars, we have questions that we can ask ourselves about data ethics and data bias. So for bias, who is included in the data that you're working with? Who is excluded? Was it intentional to exclude them? So those are things that we can think about going all the way back to statistic. Is your sample representative of your population or is it excluding a certain demographic? When we go down to privacy, who owns the data? Was this data given to you, right? And was it, and are you doing with the data with the person intended for you to do with the data, okay? So who owns the data and how will the privacy of that data be protected? Who can be negatively impacted by your machine learning algorithm, right? So you have to think about the societal impact. How will this algorithm or model be utilized? And will it have some negative impacts on society as a whole? And finally, what is the core purpose? What is the intent for doing this data model in the first place, right? So we want to think about these four pillars of bias, privacy, societal impact, and intent as we transition into our scenarios. So our first scenario today and this is gonna be the discussion, okay? So I have kind of like a, a fake scenario, but it's definitely based off of real premises, right? So the University of Nowhere uses a predictive analytic system to support advising for undergraduate students. The system uses each student's high school record, standardized test scores, previous college coursework to calculate based on the algorithm developed from several prior years of student data, how likely a student is to be successful in a particular course. So I want you to digest that scenario here. We have a university, they have an algorithm that's able to predict how successful a student will be in a course based off of some data that they have gathered. So in the chat, I want you to write, what are some potential bias, privacy or societal impact concerns that you would have by looking at this scenario or could that could potentially arise
And so I'm going to start and give an example first, right? So feel free to chime in. So it looks like all of these data points are pretty much academic data points, right? And they are measuring if they will be successful in a particular course. But we all know that standardized test scores in itself has bias in it that certain demographics perform better on standardized test scores than other demographics. So that could be a potential bias in this scenario. Can anyone else think of any biases or privacy concerns, societal impact or intent that could arise from this scenario? Yeah, so how will the algorithm's output be used? Right, and will it say that a student should not take a course just because they are at risk for not being successful? Yep, people could have education that's geared towards excelling on this standardized test. There are some contextual data that could be missing, right? So if someone is has anxiety when taking tests, things of that nature. And then also when you're getting a student's high school record, how did you obtain those records? Do the students know? A lot of things on your high school record could be attendance things. It could be free lunch programs, et cetera. So are you really securing that student's privacy when you're obtaining these records? Is it actually shared with educators? So other teachers at the university and will that teacher have an implicit bias towards that student before the student even starts the course? All of those are great examples that you guys gave in the chat and I totally agree. So based off of this scenario, data used and data left out. So test scores in itself could be a bias indicator because as someone mentions, it doesn't take in, into account anxiety. We do know that there's achievement gaps when it comes to standardized test performance. How the algorithm was trained. It said that it was trained on several years of student data, but were those several years representative of the entire student population or did it, for instance, was only trained on males? And so that way it will assign a lower risk score to females, right? privacy they're getting the entire student high school record that's just not filled with academic information it has information pertaining to like i said absences economic status things of that nature so how are you making sure that their data is used properly and is secure if you launch this algorithm because of some of the biases in the data collection itself or data being left out could you potentially exclude certain students from taking certain courses and thus limit the diversity of the entire university? And as someone mentioned the intent, so they said that it's used for advising decisions, but does this fall in the hands of teachers or educators, right? And so that the educator would have an implicit bias towards a student before a student even begins, right? And these are all the questions that we wanna ask ourselves, right? at the business understanding phase of what could potentially be biases or ethical concerns that we have before we proceed to data preparation, modeling, et cetera. So awesome, thanks everyone for participating in that scenario. So now let's talk about a little bit about data bias and racial bias and look at a real life scenario along with the data science framework known as Chris DM. So in this scenario, um, racial bias in healthcare. So you can see from this bold headline that took place back in 2019 that millions of Black people affected by racial bias in healthcare algorithms. And if you look at the footnote underneath this picture, it says Black people with complex medical needs were less likely than equally ill white people to be referred to programs that provided more personalized care. So there was an algorithm that was developed and launched and utilized where Black people who were just as ill as white people were not referred to some of these personalized medical care programs as much as white people were. So there was a bias in this algorithm. So let's think about the whole 
scenario by looking at the Chris DM process. Okay. So Chris DM is like a cross industry standard for data mining. So many data analysts, as well as data science kind of go through this cyclical process when they're trying to understand the business, understand the data, create a model and then deploy it. So it's like this cycle that we follow. So the business question or the business understanding that they wanted to help address was to how to allocate healthcare resources. That sounds like a question that has good intent, but let's look at what they have in the data. So they gathered demographic data as well as healthcare costs across one year as well as healthcare conditions, whether it was stroke, diabetes, et cetera. Fast forward to how they prepped the data and how they modeled it. So they had the assumption that total healthcare um, cost was used since the average healthcare cost was equal among demographics. So basically they said the average cost for a black person receiving healthcare is the same as a white person receiving healthcare, and they aggregated this cost up. The algorithm used this assumption and it assigned risk score. So the higher risk you were from this algorithm, the more likely you were referred to a specialized care program to help increase your health status. Evaluation. So once the model was um, created, we evaluate the model and the algorithm assigned lower risk scores to Blacks who were equally as sick as whites. Now, the creators didn't know this about the algorithm. They did not evaluate this before they deployed it. But this is what researchers went back and found, that it has lower risk scores to Blacks than it does white. But they ended up deploying it, okay? So they deployed it to um, hundreds of hospitals within the United States that manage care for over 200 million patients. So this is a case where an algorithm was used that had bias in it, particularly racial bias, and it was deployed to millions of patients. Now, what did further research into the algorithm show, right? That if you look at the cost broken out by condition, so not just looking at the overall cost within one demographic group, but looking at the condition, whether they have a stroke, heart attack, diabetes, et cetera, it showed that Black's average cost was $1,800 less than whites with the same condition. Why is that the case? Well, this could be a lot of reasons why, but me being within the Black community and also looking at some research on this, there is distrust in the healthcare system for minorities, as well as the fear of racial discrimination by healthcare providers. So it doesn't mean that they don't need healthcare. It just means that they have a bad experience with the healthcare system. And that is why the cost that they spend on healthcare can be viewed as less than one of um, a white background. So some calls to action. So researchers looked into this algorithm and they picked it apart and pretty much they found other variables than just overall healthcare costs that can determine medical need, right? So they repeated the analysis after tweaking the algorithm and in turn, it has a happy ending, which I'm happy to say, it reduced the bias by 84%. So before you even get to that model deployment stage, right? It's very important to think about the bias because once you deploy that model, you're affecting millions, if not hundreds of millions, billions of humans with your model. Okay. So we also can look at this um, from violations in healthcare. And this infographic is going to give you more granularity about how you can have disparities in the problem you're trying to solve, how you can have disparities amongst the data that you collect. Is it not representative of the population? And we're definitely going to send these slides out so you can look at this a little bit further, as well as disparities and biases and ethical concerns within how you develop your algorithm and how you even deploy it. Okay. So now pivoting from healthcare, let's talk about a quick scenario within policing. And this is probably one of the most common scenarios that I have heard about since I've transitioned into the data science field. And this this concept and this controversy around predictive policing, right? So 
can we make an algorithm to predict or utilize facial recognition to predict if this person is capable of performing a crime or has already performed a crime? So this scenario comes out of UK. And like I said, the um, deck is gonna have all of the links that you can refer to as well at the bottom of the slide. But pretty much 98% of this metropolitan in the, in the UK wrongly identified innocent people doing facial recognition, 98%, right? So this is innocent people going to jail, being fined, et cetera, right? When you think about the idea of facial recognition and predictive policing, you can also survey how does the audience or the wider community or humanity actually feels about this, right? Because if you have distrust within the public, you're gonna have distrust within your algorithm, right? So within the United States, 64% of US citizens approve facial recognition actually being used by law enforcement. So there is a good chunk, right, of individuals who do not approve of this method. And within the UK, a lot based off of this incident where they have the 98% incorrect identification, 25% actually believe that using facial recognition in AI in general would be positive for the UK overall. Okay, so a lot of when we think about ethical concerns, we want to think about the concerns of humanity. Do they agree with giving their data up, right, in this whole internet of things so that you can make your business better? Um, do they agree with some of these tactics like facial recognition for law enforcement usage, et cetera, et cetera? Because once you can really look into the ethics and the biases, right, then if it's ethical, you can get buy-in from the community. All right, so in conclusion, because we looked at a couple of scenarios about humans behind the data point, right? All in all, I hope to drive home the point, data points represent people, right? I know that you see the Excel sheet in front of you, you see the CSV in front of you, so it's hard to really look at every row as a human. But if you think of it that way, you're going to be able to ask these questions about ethics around your data, look out for biases sooner on in the CRIS DM process, okay, than later. And I like to leave you from this quote, why not quote myself, right? The human behind the data is more important than the data itself. So that being said, that was our quick um, tech talk about the human story behind the data point. I hope that was informative. And now, Corey, I can pass it back over to you so we can take questions. Thank you, Jelly. Okay, y'all, I didn't see any questions in the q and If you guys would like to start asking questions, you can do it straight in the chat box at this point. Uh, anybody have any questions about what we went over today? That was amazing, by the way, Jelly. Thank you so much. I think, Corey, you always think that I'm amazing. See, I love, see, you guys get yourself a support system. If you're looking for a job, get a job with employers and coworkers that actually support and believe in you and get you some great students like I have in the chat, giving me a whole bunch of claps. <laughs> Let's see, it looks like we do have one question. All right, I think I got it. Yeah, so any questions that I always try to ask when starting out a project or any templates for us to follow? So the main question when a client comes to me, especially in my consultant roles, not now as an instructor, right? But is how was the data collected? Okay, how was the data collected? Did you get sales data from all of your stores in the Northeast? And now you're trying to predict how other stores would produce sales? right? Does your data have data for, um, I work for higher education, for students um, across all demographics? How is the data collected? And what is the business problem that you're trying to solve? Because sometimes our business problem can even be bias itself, okay? So always, 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 okay? try to understand how the data was obtained. Do they have permission? There are federal guidelines, right? And legal ramifications for data usage, right? So how was the data obtained? When was the last time it was updated? Can you tell me anything about the data collection? What is the problem that you hope to solve? 
Looks like we got a couple more. Um, define data privacy between USA and other countries. Yeah, so that was definitely um, the segue of this last question, right? So data privacy, we have federal regulations in the United States as a whole that we have to follow. Um, privacy issues and how we obtain data and do we give them a whole bunch of terms and conditions and have somebody agree to the data, right, being obtained, et cetera. So there's federal guidelines in the United States, right? Now, states can also regulate data usage on a state-by-state -state basis. Some states are stricter than others, right? So I highly recommend from a legal standpoint, and I know that there's a lot of data, um, I know some data analysts that work in the legal system, and it's actually a lot of laws that you have to abide by when you're talking about collecting data, right? You just can't strip data from an open API, right? When you go on Twitter and you scrape down tweets, they make you read their whole API terms and conditions, right? And it's a lot in those. Now, in other countries I'm unfamiliar with, I will say for the pharmaceutical industry, we have offshored a lot of things to India. In India, our team in India was responsible for looking at those data ethics, those legalities behind data usage there as well. And then we have, when did you realize that data ethics was an area that you wanted to specialize in and why? Hmm, I wouldn't say I'm, a, I'm an expert at data ethics, right? It's just something that stays at the forefront of my mind. But I think we all have experiences of when we've experienced some type of discrimination, some type of bias or some type of unethical thing that happens in life. Me just being a double minority, that has been the story of my life um, ever since I came about, right? So me really not wanting others to be impacted by unethical data usage and unethical algorithms really propelled me to make sure that I ask these tough questions. Let's see, is there any topic that you're interested in apart from the hospital and police algorithm? Huh. So there's tons of data ethics use cases, right? You're talking about credit card fraud, a whole bunch of stuff. It goes on and on. But if I have to talk about data science and machine learning in general, hmm. So I think one of so one of my projects from my master's program was predicting substance abuse relapse, right? And it looked at a whole bunch of drug panels from patients to see when we can intervene when we think that they may be at risk from relapsing based on how many times they call um, into the support hot hotline, how many times they show up for their group therapy and also their random drug tests. And that was actually utilized to help save a few lives. And that was under a non-disclosure agreement. So that's pretty high level of what I can say about that. But that purposeful data science for good project always motivates me, okay? I love data science for good says, what steps can we take to minimize bias in our data sets? So from the get-go, data exploration, right? So explore your data. I cannot tell you this enough. If you are spending a month exploring your data, don't let anybody at your company tell you that you should rush, okay? You need to look what's in the data. Look at every column. Look what's not missing in the data. Be the discipline expert. If you have a job in anti-money laundering, but you know nothing about finance, you need to take that time to learn everything you can about finance, because then you can identify what was missing in the data, what is in the data that could be related to other variables, right? So just dropping race alone in a data set does not mean that your data set doesn't have racial bias, because race is related to social economic status, which is related to education, et cetera. So be the expert, right, in, um, in the field that you're working with, with data. And that is probably one of the best pieces of advice I could give. <laughs> Gabriella said, say it louder for those in the back. <laughs> okay, if we don't have any more questions, we are going to wrap up. This is gonna be my last call. Does anybody have any other questions we'd like to talk to Jelly about tonight? Okay, um, we need a part two. I, yes. have a, I have a lot of LinkedIn. <laughs> I go on LinkedIn every day. I think Corey sees me on LinkedIn probably 50 times a day, right? And you all can also follow me on LinkedIn, right? It's my first and last name. I'm, and there's not a lot of Angelica Spratleys, right? But LinkedIn gives me all of that updated current information that I need. That I need. Oh, thank you, Julia. 
for Python, for YouTube. Oh, you well, we, want a part two? We, you everybody guys, wants a part two. Out. <laughs> share it out and maybe we can make a part two, right? <laughs> so you can find all of our videos on our YouTube channel. I'm going to paste that in the chat right now. Um, please go and subscribe. I want to thank everybody and especially Jelly uh, for joining us tonight. Um, do, you have LinkedIn link? um, do, I, do I have your LinkedIn link? Look, I'm asking you about my life. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I can post it real quick for you guys. No, Corey, yeah, keep it for 30 seconds, okay? Oh, yeah. Oh, you're totally fine. There you go. Um, also, if you'd like more information about our program, please reach out to our admissions team. They're here to answer all of your questions, um, and they can introduce you to our data science program or any other programs that you guys are interested in. Um, the video will be sent out in the next three business days, everybody that attended and registered for the event, and then you'll get a copy of Jelly's slide deck as well, so that you can keep all that great information for later. And yeah, we just thank everybody and we'll see you next time. Have a good okay. night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming. Bye.